All right, John 12, John 12, 12. We're going back. You guys know we saved this um, section of scripture, obviously, for this week. And so the Bible says in John chapter 12, the next day, the large crowd, what kind of crowd? The large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, so they did something really interesting. They took branches of palm trees, went out to meet him, crying out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the what? Even the King of Israel. Hey, why don't we all say this together? Notice it's in, uh, there are exclamation points, so it's in the imperative, so they like said it really loudly, ready, one, two, three. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, yeah, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first because they never did. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written about him and had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees, this is so classic, you can hear the despair in their voice. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are gaining nothing. Look, the whole world has gone after him. That's good. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. God, we are filled with thanks this morning, gratitude. Thank you for your son, our savior. God, your son, our redeemer, your son, our healer. God, your son, our rescuer, and and your son, our king. Today we pray that you would move in this place, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit. This wouldn't be just another Palm Sunday. But God, we pray our hearts, our hearts would be surrendered in worship to the almighty maker of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Show us today. God, may there not be a single heart in this room that doesn't understand why they need Jesus as the king of their life. We love you, God. We pray that you would magnify and exalt your son. It's in his name that we pray. All God's people said, amen. Amen. You can have a seat. You know, when we talk about monarchies, I think it's kind of hard for us as Americans to get it because you know monarchies in the mind of Americans have a hard row to hoe all the way back to the American Revolution. You know, in the American Revolution, Thomas Paine, who was a significant individual during the time, in his book, Common Sense, he drove the point home that there is no king but God. And so I think from our point of view, this kingly concept is contrary to the American way, unless it's for gossip and tabloids because then we're kind of interested, right? You can think about you know who. We're kind of interested, but other than that, it's like, hey, keep your kings to yourself. You know, this is why the cry of the children of Israel is so confounding to us when they said to the preeminent prophet Samuel, give us a king. You remember that dark day in Israel's history They had been a theocracy, they were governed by God, but they began to look at the other nations around them and they began to pine after this principle of monarchy to the extent where they literally said not only to, like I said, the preeminent prophet, but even to God. We don't want a theocracy anymore. We don't want to be governed by God. We want to be like the other nations. And so give us a king. And yet... God birthed beauty from Israel's blunder and turned their request for a king into an eternal promise that changed the world. And by the way, y'all, this is what God does. God takes our blunders, God takes our foibles, God takes our falters, God takes our failings, and you know because he's the only one who can do it, he takes our ashes and he makes them into something Beautiful, man. I love that about God. 
and I hope, I hope you do as well. God took this really dark day, this otherwise depressing day, as this uh, demand was declared to this preeminent prophet, and they wanted to turn in their theocracy for a monarchy. God turns it around, and what does he do? He gives Israel a king. He gives them the greatest king. And that's what the triumphal entry is all about. The triumphal entry is all about Jesus Christ being revealed as the king of Israel. In fact, for you students of scripture and, and, and for those of you who do read carefully, you noted that as we were reading these two Old Testament quotes, there was one consistent word that was threaded between both of them. Let me just reread from Psalm 118. That's the first Old Testament verse quoted here. As the people are gathered together, let me just like, like paint the picture for you. There Jesus is, three and a half years into his earthly ministry. He's on the apex of the Mount of Olives. It's a crazy day. Uh, the Feast of Passover is just about to be celebrated. Super significant moment as all of these people are gathering into the city of Jerusalem like I'll tell you later, Josephus says that the population, the tourist population, we kind of get this being in Vegas, the tourist population of, of Jerusalem ballooned to about 2 million people. And there at the Mount of Olives, all of these people have gathered together because Jesus is at the apex of the mountain. And you know what these people do? They do something so interesting. They take palm branches and the Bible says they laid them out before Jesus. So when he would have gone from the apex of the Mount of Olives down to the Kidron Valley along that road, the people had laid out palm branches. Other gospel accounts tells us that they took off their outer garments and laid them out too. All of this, um, because if you think back to the time of monarchies, there was this respect, there was this honor that they had for kings. There was this sense of dignity and the people, out of a show of respect, would dignify the king so much that they wouldn't even want the dirt of the soil to touch his feet. And so all of these palm branches are laid out and clothes are laid out. And then the, the, the congregation that's gathered there on that day, they declare Psalm 118, Hosanna, that is to say, save now. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even, check this out, even the king of Israel. And then in addition to that, the disciples looking back recognize this to be a fulfillment of Zechariah chapter 9, where Zechariah said that the king, Israel's king, would come one day and stand on the top of the Mount of Olives. Now, he, listen, he's going to do that twice. In his second coming, after he wipes out the armies that are gathered at the Valley of Jezreel, the Battle of Armageddon, Jesus is going to stand on the top of the Mount of Olives, the Bible says. It's going to split in two, and there's going to be a stream of water that flows into the Mediterranean and down into the Dead Sea and causes the Dead Sea to teem with life. And then he's going to set up his millennial rule and reign. In this particular coming, in his first coming, he came humbly. He was on the colt, the foal of a donkey, which is exactly what Zechariah says, behold your king, your king coming not in pomp and circumstance, not in power and authority, exercising it in a sense in a human way, but coming as it were as a suffering servant. That thread, fear not daughter of Zion, behold your king is coming, is woven throughout the Old Testament. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's right to say, well, what does, what does it mean for Jesus to be king? And then in addition to that, you might be thinking today, well, that's great that Israel had a king, but why do I need a king? Can I remind you today that Jesus Christ is God's Messiah? That means he is the chosen one of God. Can I remind you today that Jesus Christ is the prophet, which means he is the truth? Can I remind you today that Jesus Christ is the priest? He is the high priest, which means that he is the mediator between man and God. There is one thing that stands between you and the almighty God. There's only one thing that mediates your relationship with God. It's not a human being. It's not a philosopher. It's not a psychologist. It's not a spiritual guru. It's not your religious works. It's not your moral capacities. It's Jesus Christ. There's one mediator between man and God. 
But listen, he is also the king. He's God's king, which means he rules and reigns sovereignly. So how was this promise of an eternal king actually birthed? Now, this I told you is kind of the story, right? There was this proclamation that the children of Israel made as they were looking at other nations, wanting to be like them, wanting an earthly king, casting off this concept of theocracy. And so the first king of Israel, do you guys remember what his name was? His, his name was Saul. Saul was the people's choice. He won the people's choice award. Really good looking dude. Handsome guy, really tall, stood head and shoulders above everybody else. But you know that there was a point in time where while Saul had a beginning where he was humble and small in his own eyes, he diverted in his relationship with God and he turned his heart away from God. And, and the people had chosen Saul, but after Saul's reign, God chose another king, a king that was after his own heart. His name was David. David was a shepherd boy. David loved the Lord. You remember Samuel goes into the house of Jesse and and because God says, hey, take your oil. You're going to go anoint the next king. He rolls into the house. There are seven sons there. Eliab is there. He's the oldest son. He pulls the oil out and God says, not so fast, son. Not so fast. Put that oil away. And uh, so he's like, Eliab, well, then the next one, the next one, the next one. He goes through all the sons and And Samuel's like, dude, you got any other kids? And Jesse's like, yeah, but he doesn't really count. (laughs) He doesn't really count. You know, he's out tending to the sheep. And this this principle, I don't know why I'm getting sidetracked right now, but pastors just get sidetracked. So go, go with me on this one. This principle God lays out, God says, hey, you know what? Man looks on the outward. Man looks on the appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so this little ruddy dude is brought before Samuel. His name is David, and he's anointed as king. And into his rule as king, God gives him a promise. And God says this to David. He says, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever." I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And you know how it goes. Like the whole thing was, Dave Dave was thinking, God, I want to build you a house. And God's like, no, I'm going to build you a house. I'm going to build you a house, and this is what I'm going to do from your offspring. Well, David ponders this. He thinks about this, and you know what he does? As the sweet psalmist of Israel, he writes a song. He writes, and and it goes something like this. Let me sing it for you today. No, I'm not going to sing it. (laughs) That would, kill, that would kill the whole vibe of the service. <laughs> but he writes a song. Like God starts to give him revelation about this coming king that would come through him. And so he pens this psalm, which of course is a song. And it goes, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that's the Hebrew word Messiah, saying... Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I've set my king on Sion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son, today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will give, I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned. O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son lest he be angry and you perish in the way for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed, this is such a great Ending to this song, blessed are all who take refuge in him. Isn't that beautiful? So, so there's this development of this picture that's given by revelation to David. And as David writes this song, he sees that God is going to establish his eternal king. That this king is going to be greater than all the kings of the earth. That this king is going to rule from Zion. He is going to be God's begotten son. All of humanity and the earth itself will be his possession. You know, kings 
rule over a region, but there's never been a king who's ruled over all of humanity and the earth. Obedience is expected. He's not to be trifled with. And then that final piece, what a great way to punctuate the song, the place of blessing is taking refuge in him. I pray today that you have found your refuge in the king of Israel, King Jesus. Well, all of this revelation is given, and then over the course of time, there is built within the prophets an expectation for this king, like we've seen. Zechariah says of this king, he's going to be revealed on the Mount of Olives. Zechariah says he's going to come on the cult, the foal of a donkey. Psalm 118 says this king is also going to be a savior, that people will declare Hosanna, which is to say, save now. And then Isaiah chapter 9, the Bible says this king is going to sit on David's throne. He will uphold justice and righteousness. I'm saying to you today that from the Old Testament perspective, this concept of an eternal king with an eternal kingdom had been being developed to the point that it was so clear that the wise men themselves were also searching for the king of Israel. You remember when they came after the birth of Christ, a couple of years after, this was what they said. They said, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? Can I just say to you today, there is no king like King Jesus. He is amazing. He is amazing. He is. And today, I just want to share with you a couple of reasons why you need him as the king of your life. Now, maybe today you already have Jesus as the king of your life. I think this is just going to settle the score for you. You know, it's going to take you a little deeper in your understanding of what it means to have Jesus as your king. On the other hand, maybe today you're like, hey, I'm the monarch of my own life. I sit on the throne of my own heart. Why, why do I, why would I need a king, an eternal king, ruling and reigning over me? Well, let me tell you first is this, as the king, Jesus alone brings you God's truth. As the king, Jesus alone brings you God's truth. There is within our culture a notion that's being advanced, that truth is like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. Like in other words, with our culture in the secular condition that it's in, the idea concerning truth is, hey, truth is relative. Truth is subjective. You know, what's good for you is good for you. What's true for you is true for you. And all of us can have our own version of the truth. But the fact is, if everyone's truth is true, then nothing is true, right? Because if everyone's truth is true, then nothing is false. And if nothing is false, then nothing is true. Okay? You're like, dude. Dude. Let me go get a shot of espresso before you start doing that business to me. But listen, you know, Pilate, this is so interesting because you, as you consider uh, especially the gospel according to John, you see this concept of Jesus as king emerging. And Pilate, who I think was the cynic of the ages, you know, was having this one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, the creator of heaven and earth. He didn't know it. I mean, you read the story and it's like, man, Jesus is on tr a trial before Pilate. But the truth is, Pilate was on trial before Jesus. And here, the cynic of the ages is listening to the master, the one who is true. And so he says in a cynical sense, so you're a king? And Jesus answered and said this. He said, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose, I was born. And for this purpose, I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Do you know how Pilate responded? Like with cynicism dripping from his lips, he says to Jesus, what is truth? He says to Jesus, what is truth? You know, according to a study by the University of Massachusetts, 60% of people can't go 10 minutes without lying. I know, that's what I said. I'm like, dang, that's not good, right? And, and, and for me as a preacher, I'm like, hey, you know what? This is a great opportunity to talk about how bad lying is. But we're not going to do that today. We're not going to do that today. I'm thinking instead, we get lied to a lot, right? I mean, you think about the fact that you are oftentimes on the receiving end of that. And it's not just in interpersonal relationships. It's also in the culture that we live in through different forms of media. It's like we live within this framework of falsehood. 
We're exposed to lies all the time, and it is understandable why there is this sense of cynicism within us. I mean, you just get burdened. You just get tired of being lied to. And the danger of cynicism is this. It can blind you so that you don't even see when truth is staring you in the face. And you know what? For Pilate, truth literally was staring him in the face. I mean, I want you to think about, I, I want you to think about what he said in the context of who's sitting in front of him, right? What is truth? And in front of him was the way, the truth, and the life. Cynicism is so, is so blinding. We can be in that place where even when truth is staring us in the face, we don't even see it. I want to tell you today, maybe you're in that cynical spot. Maybe today you've been fatigued by the falsehoods. You're just overwhelmed. I've got good news. Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the truth. That's right. And as the truth, he will never lie to you. He will never lie to you. The truth of Christ is worthy to build your life on. In fact, Jesus said this to his disciples, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. Today, maybe you've been bound up in lies. Today, maybe your heart has just been fatigued and you've become cynical. Today, maybe there's that sense of dysfunction in your life because, you know, it's not just that you've been lied to, it's that you've done the lying. And today there's chaos in your life that's a consequence of it. I've got great news for you today. His truth will set you free. His truth will liberate you from the lies of the devil. His truth, if you yield to his truth and build your life upon his truth, he will take the chaos and the dysfunction and the consequences of your your lies and sins and he will turn them around. He will cause you to fly right side up. He will pull you up out of the pit of your own making, and he will set your feet upon a rock, and he will give you a new beginning. That's what he does. He's the only one who can do it because he alone brings God's truth. The second thing today is this. As the king, he, Jesus, alone rescues you from from the brokenness that's caused by sin. As the king, Jesus alone rescues rescues you from the brokenness that's caused by sin. You know, the Jews killed Jesus because he made himself equal to God. The Romans killed Jesus because he made himself equal to Caesar. And while these things are true, we know ultimately God delivered his own son up to rescue us from our sin. You know, it's interesting In this gospel account, like I said, the concept of a suffering king just emerges. It emerges. And I'll tell you, you know, I've studied this gospel account uh, over the years. And for some reason, this is the first time I've recognized the connection between Jesus as king and his suffering. And I wanted to read to you some of the various verses found in John chapter 19 and 20 during the suffering of Christ and how it's connected to Jesus as the king. You don't have to turn there today, but think about this. Pilate said to the children of Israel, to the religious leaders, he said, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And then Pilate's guard, remember during the scourging, the Bible says they came to Jesus, they declared, hail king of the Jews, and they struck him with their hands. Pilate said to them, behold your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. And then in another verse, the Bible says, so he delivered him over to them to be crucified. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. You remember during the suffering when Christ was crucified, most likely outside of the Damascus gate. He was crucified on the side of the road and as he was hanging on the cross at eye level, maybe possibly the crown of thorns still pressed down upon his forehead. People being able to look at him in the eyes. He, he was, his clothes were torn completely from him. It was the ultimate way of disgracing somebody. And as he hung there, the religious leaders looked at him and said, he called himself the king. 
Let the king bring himself down from the cross. He saved others, himself he could not save. And I want to say to you today, it's not that he could not save himself, it's that he would not save himself. He endured the cross for the sake of others. He gave himself for you and for me. Jesus chose the cross for his throne. Because of love, the king died in your place. On this day, the day of the triumphal entry, there were two things that were happening on the top of the Mount of Olives. Number one, God was declaring his king, this day that had been appointed, that had been laid out to the very particular day by Daniel the prophet. So the father was saying, this is the king, this is my king, this is the one who's going to sit eternally on the throne of David, but also the father was selecting a lamb on that day. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but it was on this particular day in the Jewish calendar, the 10th of Nisan, that every father over every house would select a lamb and bring it to be inspected by the priests. Two million people in Jerusalem at the time, Josephus says there were 250,000 lambs that would have been selected on this particular day. A father getting a lamb, looking over the lamb himself, bringing the lamb to the priest, making sure it was without spot or blemish so that four days later, it could be offered as a sacrifice for the atonement of the sin of the family. And on this day, on the day of the selection of the lambs, this is what God the Father did. The Father for his whole house selected for himself a lamb that was without spot and blemish. The words of John the Baptist ring in my head this morning, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. A Lamb that was tempted in all points as we are tempted, and yet he was without sin. His blood more valuable than the blood of all the doves and bulls and goats that have been sacrificed over the course of time. One sacrifice made for all of humanity, sufficient for your forgiveness and for my forgiveness. He is the Lamb of God. He is the Lamb of God who gave himself so that you could be rescued from your sin. He came to preach the good news to the poor. He came to bind up the brokenhearted. He came to proclaim liberty to the captives. And he came to set free those who are bound. Have you put your trust and faith in him? There's no king like our king. There's no king like our king. No earthly ruler is going to satisfy the deepest soul longings of your life. You need a king who will love your soul into eternity. The third thing today is this. As the king, Jesus alone is worthy of your worship. As the king, Jesus alone is worthy of your worship. You guys know you're made to worship, right? You're made to worship. Um, humanity is theotropic. That means we all have a, a tendency, an inclination, a proclivity to worship something. You say, you know what, we live in a godless age. Well, even the godless age, the vacuum of this godless age is filled with idols. Everybody worships something. You might be worshiping your money. You might be worshiping your house, nice house, gated community, the one that you've always wanted. You might be worshiping, I went through the whole list today, all right? <laughs> you can worship belongings, your cars, your clothes, your physical body. You can be worshiping people in your life. You can be worshiping your friends. You can be worshiping your family. You can be worshiping your ambitions, your desires, your dreams. You can be worshiping your education. You've got that placard on the wall, and to you it re represents everything that you are. It's your identity, and you worship your identity. Have I missed anything? <laughs> anything you guys add to that list? Yes, yeah, celebrities. Yeah, somebody walking out today said, Pastor, you know what? I would have added celebrities to that list. So, Corey, thank you very much. We worship celebrities. We call them stars, right? We call them stars. We set them up as idols that, that we worship. And you know, the thing is this. You've been made in the image of God. You've been made in the image of God. You have dignity and you have value. And I would suggest to you today, as being made in the image of God, you need to be worshiping the thing that has the greatest value that has the greatest value in the universe, and that's not your car, that's not your education, that's not a movie star, that's not a celebrity, 
That's not your house. That's not your clothes. That's not the way you look. It's not your education. The only one that's really worthy of your worship is Jesus Christ. And, and listen, I want, to t- I want to tell you why. I want, to tell you, I want to tell you what you get from that and how you know all those other things aren't worthy of your worship because you know what? You can have a lot of money and, and, and still you're empty. You know, like Rockefeller said, hey, to that reporter who said to him, you know, when's enough enough? And he said, just a little more. You can have all this money and it's like, it doesn't meet the need. You can have a car, the car gets old. You know how we are with our possessions. We want a new thing. We love our house for a minute. Then we see somebody else's house and pretty soon we're worshiping the house that somebody else has and we're not happy until we get it. Like there's a dissatisfaction when you worship things that are not worthy of your worship. Jesus is the only one who's gonna bring you sincere satisfaction. He's the only one who can fill your cup. He's the only one who can cause your cup to overflow. He's the only one that's gonna bring you to a place where you can say, you know what? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not want. And I love how the apostle Paul puts it. He says this twice in his first epistle to Timothy. It's so good. He says, and you know, it's like, this is the thing, right? This is the thing. It's, you know, I can just imagine inspiration. He's writing, and then he's just like, he's a horse that's in the gate, and he just, he's got to worship, right? He's got to worship, and so he's saving this for the end, but he can't wait to the end because it's just so good, and so he gets to the end of chapter one, and he's like, I just got to say it because his heart was filled with worship. He says, to the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever, amen. Man is so good. It's so good. He's the only one that's worthy of your worship because he is the only one whose value is is worth your worship. And then in addition to that, he's the only one that can really bring you a sense of satisfaction. As the king, Jesus alone is worthy of your worship. Final thing today is this. As the king, Jesus alone will usher in an eternal kingdom. As the king, Jesus alone will usher in an eternal kingdom. I don't know about you guys, but man, the world needs Jesus as its king. I mean, for goodness sakes, right? There's just turmoil everywhere. Like the world is on fire. There's turmoil in the U.S., there's turmoil in France, there's turmoil in the Ukraine, there's turmoil in Russia, there's turmoil in the Middle East, there's turmoil in Israel. You know, our trip, we just got back just in time, riots were just beginning, like as we're getting ready to get on the bus that night, riots are breaking out all over Israel because of judicial reform, like they were on the brink of civil war. And you see all of this calamity and this global unease and turmoil and, you know, topic for another time, but the groundwork is being laid for the Antichrist. That's just, that's the reality, that there is, that there is going to be a counterfeit king that comes on the scene seeming to bring all of these solutions who will make a covenant relationship with the nation of Israel for seven years and three and a half years he'll go into the rebuilt temple and he'll commit the abomination of desolation and Israel at least will awaken from their slumber and recognize they've made a covenant with the wrong king. All of that is coming to pass, but let me just say to you, he inaugurated his kingdom through his death and resurrection, and everything is moving towards his ultimate goal, which is his universal reign over a redeemed heaven and earth. That's where everything is going. He's instituted a kingdom. Right now, it's over the hearts and minds of men and women who are humble enough to kiss the king, to put their trust and faith in him. And then one day, this king is going to come again. He's gonna come again. And as he comes cruising on his white horse in his second coming, and, and you know, like, oh, the contrast is amazing. I don't know if you, you guys know this, but on the day of the triumphal entry, on the east side of Israel, you have Jesus on the colt, the foal of a donkey in humility. On the west side through the Jaffa Gate, you had, you had Pontius Pilate, Josephus says, riding triumphantly into the city on a white horse. 
fascinating to me, the juxtaposition of those two things. But the second coming of Christ, he will be on a white horse. And the Bible says, as he rides into the city of Jerusalem, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written. Do you know what it is? King of kings and Lord of lords. It's good. And I just want to ask you today, are you ready? Are you ready for that? Are you ready for the coming of Christ? Is your heart prepared? If the answer is no, I just want you to think back to what David said, kiss the king. Kiss the king. What does that mean? It means respect him and honor him by coming to him in faith. Be wise enough to humble yourself and receive him into your heart. Bow your life to him and adore him with everything that you have and find your place of refuge in him because this king is like no other king. He will never let you down. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much that you've given to us our redeemer, our savior, the lover of our souls, our king, Jesus. And we pray today, God, for every heart in this place who has yet to trust in him. God, may this be the day that those hearts are humbled and moved by the power of your Holy Spirit to respond in faith. 